Joy here with Real Progressives. Tonight, I am back with another awesome uh, Bernie Crack candidate. Um, tonight, I'm joined by Christopher Armitage. Um, he is in the state of Washington, District 5. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Chris. I appreciate it. Really glad to be here. Uh, I I was checking out your stuff and it's just so nice to be able to find other progressives. I mean, looking at, um, you know, how much has changed since the 2016 election and because of the work of Senator Sanders to build something beyond himself that, that you know, I mean, he's, he, I, you know, he's, he's the legacy he's already created in the last few years as possibly the greatest organizer of the working class in the United in the history of the United States uh, is just so powerful to see. And I know that, you know, the ability to win this district as a progressive, it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for presidents or sorry <laughs> for uh, Senator Sanders. That was an accident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we were actually just kind of loosely discussing you were um, in, in the air force, you are a veteran um, and you um, were speaking on essentially what's going down today with Trump and the Kurds, which is no short of terrifying. Um, and you said that your campaign released a statement. Um, can you just kind of elaborate on your, your feelings on, on basically what's going on? Yeah, I I have a pretty close history with the Kurdish people. Uh, when I I'm one of my two deployments to the Middle East when I was on the Iraqi border doing security, I got to go out to little villages and meet Kurds and did security with some of them pretty regularly. And I also even went to high school with a Kurdish family and got to learn a lot about that. And Seeing what's happening right now because of, you know, President Trump's impulsive decisions uh, and probably corruption related, uh, it's people's lives are being sold. That's that's one of the big things in our campaign is we talk about not for sale. And whether it's our representative here, Republican uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers or President Trump, they're selling human lives. They're selling our health. They're selling our ability to have housing. And on a deeper level, they're selling uh, what, what we were promised when this nation was founded, the aspiration that we could pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And so people are gonna needlessly die. The suffering of millions, the death of millions over the last few years that rests on the words and tweets of someone who does not use their words or tweets carefully. Absolutely. So being as though, you know, being that you have been in the military, what is it like for you to see that, you know, these, these, um, you know, military budgets for like over $700 uh, billion dollars are being passed and by granted by some of the, the candidates running for president, nonetheless, um, Bernie voted no all three times. But anyway, so <laughs> what is that like to just see, you know, the, the warmongering that is being pushed when you were actually one of the people who went over? Yeah, I, I mean, I carried a gun every day for my, it's often to a rifle and a pistol for my time in the Air Force. And while I was in, uh, thanks to the military, I was able to get a Master's of Science in Homeland Security. And part of why I pursued, I mean, the main reason I pursued military service was because I wanted to be able to have health care and have economic mobility and have a living wage. But, you know, I also pursued Homeland Security and security related jobs because I have a strong sense of justice. And I unfortunately learned that those ideals are pretty, pretty well betrayed in the current system, the for profit system that we have for profit war. And. You know, it just comes back. There's people out there who are hurting. There's people, whether it's I mean, in our own nation. I met people at the our, our warming shelter that uh, closed a few nights ago here in Spokane. And there were people there who are mentally ill and their only crime is just not having family members to take care of them. And they're going to they're going to freeze to death on the streets. 
And, you know, when I went over to the Middle East and just saw how much money was being dumped into what we were doing out there and 700 billion, $800 billion budgets. And that, that also doesn't include the Department of Homeland Security, which has over 21 different intelligence agencies within it. It has FEMA, it has, it has some good services too, but they're the third biggest department of our government. Their budget's pretty large too. And so, you know, we continue to find the money to dump into this for-profit system and no one ever asks any questions. And then when we have people dying on the streets here, you know, 20% of people with schizophrenia are living on the streets. And um, it, you know, like I said, I was drawn to the military because of a sense of justice. And that is not what I found. And now I'm running for Congress because I want to help fix that. Is that ultimately what inspired you to run? Well, I mean, with those, you know, with those feelings, I could have just gone and worked on someone else's campaign or something. Why I decided to run was, you know, community organizers. And we were asking ourselves, who do we want to vote for? Our candidate in 2018 raised a lot of money, but she only did public speaking engagements and private fundraisers. Uh, she took money from big pharma, Wall Street banks, payday lenders, you name it. And when it came down to it, none of us really wanted to vote for her. We, we did because she was better than the alternative. But um, so, yeah, we asked ourselves, who do we want to vote for? I'm also a stand up comedian. And it's the same question I ask when I'm telling jokes. What do I find funny? So uh, I we I mean, most of us pretty much agreed like, hey, we, they got to be a progressive. They can't take big money. They need to support Medicare for all. They need to support tuition free universities and trade schools. And you know what? We'd like to vote for someone young. We'd like to vote for a veteran. You know, I'm a pretty big Richard Ojeda fan um, and getting to see other veterans who, who can leave the military and say, wow, uh, it was nice having a living wage and, and housing as a right and universal health care. Maybe other people should have that, too, without having to carry a gun. Uh, in the Middle East or, or, you know, you name it. And so um, I said, all right, well, I I think I, I can fit those categories. I think that I'm someone in particular who can win in this district because, you know, this district has a pretty large military base and I was stationed there for two, for both of my enlistments. And so as someone, especially in the, with the military background, people, I don't think a lot of people are aware of how much that that really forces and molds you into someone who needs to be able to interact with people from very diverse backgrounds, politically, economically, you name it. And so, you know, I spent years on teams with people where, you know, we were doing very intense training and going deployments and doing law enforcement stateside. And so I, I feel really comfortable. I've dealt with people on the worst day of their lives. I just, I, you know, I'm raising my hand here just like I raised mine for the military because not everyone can serve in the military and not everyone is the best candidate to win a race. But I'm I believe I'm the right person for this job because of my background, and because of my experience and also as a working class person, too. You know, I'm not just going to wait around like the Democrats in our district who just are like, OK, who has money? All right. I guess it's you. Yeah. Well, um, there's a couple of people asking what district. Um, it's District 5 in Washington State. Um, you said that there's uh, nine counties? Nine counties with two-thirds of the population being in one of them. Wow. Um, yeah, it's bigger than New Jersey. Our district is 20% bigger than New Jersey. Incredible. Um, the um, so being part of the LGBTQ community when you were in the military, what was that like? I mean, I know <laughs> we've come far, but yeah, what, I, you know, you know what I mean. That was a poor way to yeah. word, you know. No, I mean? no, before <laughs> I joined, uh, so for my first year or two in the Air Force, don't ask, don't ask, don't tell was still in effect, um, and I wasn't out yet. Uh, I still, I'm actually doing a forum at Whitworth, or sorry, Whitman University in a few weeks on toxic masculinity. Uh, and, you know, I'll share a little bit more of my story and how, um, you know, I didn't come out to myself until I was 
about out of the military. And it was just because, you know, the culture didn't really, um, I, I just didn't understand why I didn't fit in, I guess is the right way to describe it. One of, one of my jokes in my stand up comedy is about how in seventh grade I had to choose between drama camp and wrestling camp. And I feel I picked wrestling camp and I feel like maybe I should have tried drama camp. Um, cause I didn't, I didn't have an easy time making friends on the wrestling team. Either. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it, it was an interesting experience and I wasn't, it's not something I really confronted within myself until I was almost out the door. But, you know, uh, I actually knew transgender tro troops while I was in and seeing their experience getting jerked around by different administrations has just been so horrific. Uh, being used as political pawns, um, that's hard to watch. And I'll, and I'll mention too, even more specifically, you know, I'm, I'm openly bisexual and so, uh, you know, I, I want to be part of a movement to help normalize, um, you know, different, different types of things that are they're pretty normal there, that it is normal. And so we shouldn't hide who we are. Absolutely. And you know what, this has happened before on my show. Um, a gentleman would like to know if you're single. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I spend, um, 18 hours a day on the campaign, you know, I, 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 I get a lot out of it. Washington, but I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and I'll say too, I see people saying, you know, they wish uh, that they could um, vote for me, but I'll tell you what, we're not taking a cent of corporate donations and I'll just get into it because it's that important. We have me and several other people who are doing this full time. We started two, three months ago and every single day we're out earning the votes in this district, gaining new volunteers, talking to students, talking to people from every demographic. And um, our goal is to get 1,000 individual contributions this month of any dollar amount. Uh, just modeled after Senator Sanders, we're making the bet here. We're rolling that D20 to use um, a D&D &D reference uh, that if we do the right thing, people will respond to it. And so that's why we're not going to take a cent from any, uh, you know, big pharma or oil and gas or any, you know, corporate interests. Awesome. Yeah. Um, something I'm going to ask you guys is something I've been asking of a, a lot of the candidates lately. If you guys can sign up to even donate a dollar, five dollars, three dollars every single month, um, then it definitely helps progressive candidates. Um, you don't have to be in the same state. Of course, if you are, definitely get out and vote. But if not, the, the importance of grassroots candidacy is being able to exist on just these small donations. And the more we raise, the more, you know, the better chance they have at winning. Um, so anyway, that's my my piece there. <laughs> Hey, and feel free to check out armitageforcongress.com. It's A-R-M-I-T-A-G-E-F-O-R congress.com. And there's donation stuff right there. And you actually um, mentioned Medicare for All. So mm -hmm. there's like, you know, there's pseudo quasi Medicare for All with like Warren and Kamala. And then there's like real Medicare for All with Bernie. So... Mm -hmm. Ever since 2020 started, I've had to actually ask what kind of Medicare for all candidates support. So do who do you what Medicare for all do you align with? Well, I'll tell you, the model I would love to be able to use more than any other is actually based off of TRICARE. And because I, I know a lot of people have had challenges with Medicare and I know that Senator Sanders addresses those. But I do also know, and I, like I said, I'll, I'm on board for Medicare for All, but the TRICARE for All template is something that I think is maybe, uh, it's the best example. You TRICARE is the military's health care, for those who don't know, and it's the best example of universal health care that exists in our nation. And what it means is pretty much you have staff doctors, and they, they're salaried. And their job is to make sure that you're happy and healthy and in fight and shape. And so... You know, in the, when I was in the military, you just went to the clinic and they helped you and you didn't have to fill out billing information. There was just records to keep track of. And doctors didn't make more if they sent you for different tests. And we had, 
you know, different machines in the same building. And they just said, oh no, you need this. So just go get that and just remove the bureaucracy, remove the lobbyists. And so it's just a system that already works. I mean, and also, you know, if you needed to go to the emergency room or something, I don't know if a lot of people watching this know how good it feels to get a bill for zero dollars for a medical thing, <laughs> but it's amazing. So, uh, you know, we didn't need parents in the military. Nobody, if you if you mention that to someone, they're gonna say, "Why would I need more? I, I I have it all. I can just go to the ER, go to the doctor anytime." Does that answer? Yeah, I mean, I've I've worked in healthcare for ten years, and I've I've worked in Tricare, so I agree. Um, Colin wants to know, um, do you still get to choose your own doctor? Yeah, absolutely. You can, that was the exact same system as you just say, you know, there's, these are all the doctors here. I'm uncomfortable with my doctor. I don't like them. That was, that's the thing. It was just your feelings. You didn't even need a justification financially. You just said, I don't like this doctor or I like that one. Or could we try someone else? Send you right over. It, that's the thing is the military is such a great example that the government can do things well when it wants to, when it prioritizes to them. And I, and I don't believe that the government does those things out of the goodness of their heart, it's because it's pragmatic, it's practical. They actually do want to save money. They actually do want to be effective. And so the template's there. Uh, I'll sign Medicare for all, but gosh, I would love to just say, instead of TRICARE covering 3 million people, it covers everyone. Right on. Um, thank you, Janice, I appreciate that. Um, Janice made a, a massive group share for us. <laughs> um, Yeah, um, one of our teammates, Andy, he's amazing. He said in Canada, it's just called healthcare. Um, it doesn't matter what it's called. They literally just have healthcare. <laughs> that must be nice. <laughs> um, one of the, the things I wanted to talk about with you um, is you actually um, follow MMT, which is not as common as we hoped in candidates. Um, and uh, you were recommended to me by a couple of people who know MMT and everything like that. So um, do you want to just touch on how you found out about it and, and things like that? Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine just put me in touch with someone and he said, hey, I know you're running for the house and I know an economist and he will talk your ear off, but you'll learn a lot. And then, I mean, I've just learned about the MMT community that they are very good at lobbying for what they believe in and they make a strong case. You know, when we went into World War II, we didn't have to find a tax to pay for it. We just did it. And then it spurred the economy. There's a lot of people who say, oh, FDR's socialist programs aren't what pulled us out of the depression. It was World War II. Well, either way, we spent our way out of it. So we didn't cut our way out of it. Absolutely. And is it FODL you've been working with? Yeah, uh, Fadel, yeah. Randy Mandel, um, I'm trying to remember, there's a name of, uh, I don't need to look it on my phone, there's a, the Andres Bern, Bernal, or I, I think okay. is his name, yeah. the advisors. Yeah. I, yeah, great people, um, and especially Fadel, gosh, uh, we've probably spent two or three hours talking, and I'm just so inspired by the people I get to talk to, honestly. Um, this campaign, just in this this early stage over the last few months, I feel like I just know so much more about the meat and potatoes. I'm so much more optimistic. I started out optimistic, but now I am just so excited for us to get in there and actually make some change. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Fado's just one of the best people ever. <laughs> um, he, I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and he's coming out to help us with an event. We're holding a, a Green New Deal forum on the 19th. Um, so he's coming out to to help us. So that's exciting. Oh, Fano's watching. To do the same thing here. <laughs> oh, nice. Right. Well, we're, we're working on um, a Green New Deal forum out here, too. Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah, hopefully January time frame. We want to. So our district is pretty rural, and so we really want to show people the pragmatic side of it because that's that's kind of um, the direction I hit any of it from. You know, when I'm talking about the Green New Deal, I'm talking about the fact that so many humans in this country 
are suffering financially. You know, the money didn't come back. Uh, we, our economy recovered, but we didn't recover. The people didn't recover. And we need to do something about that. And so, um, you know, it's not just enough to have low unemployment. We need good employment. Absolutely. Um, aw, Farrell says, so inspiring and energizing to work with you all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, being able to learn these things from these people is like, yeah, you got it made. <laughs> so and as far as the, <laughs> you, you support the federal job guarantees specifically then? That's actually the part I mentioned the most. I probably say federal jobs guarantee in my messaging more than I say Green New Deal. Yeah, same. <laughs> so, you know, with the, the Yang gang and everything, you know, UBI is the way to go and federal jobs guarantee you're, you're going to end up being construction workers and, you know, all this stuff. What is, how do you explain to people the, the benefits of the federal job guarantee? Yeah, well, I'll say, too, though, that as far as, you know, between the UBI or the federal jobs guarantee, I mean, gosh, I I had a commander who used to say the best answer is the right answer. The second best answer is the wrong answer. And the worst answer is no answer. And so I like that they're putting out an answer, you know, let it rise in the marketplace of ideas. But we are all to the left of President Trump and the GOP. Ninety nine percent of Americans are. And so, you know, I, I definitely don't spend too much time you know, uh, pushing one over the other, but I do believe in the federal jobs guarantee and that's what I'm a proponent of. Uh, and so, you know, how I bring it to people is I say, you want good jobs. It's what brought us out of World War II. It's what built the middle class in this country. Why do we have to be building bombs? Why can't we build sustainable energy sources? What's, does one have more economic value than the other? Well, actually it does. Sustainable energy sources. In one morning on a Syrian air base, we dropped almost $100 million worth of bombs. In one morning. Oh yeah, and you know, talk, go back to the military budget. I mean, that's a jobs program. That offers economic mobility to people. That's, it doesn't get much more socialist than the military. And I wish more people would realize that. And Syria doesn't even really have an army. No. We just bomb them anyway. Oh my God. Wow. Hey, Andy, I think Chris wants to be banned. Uh, so you could take care of that, bud. Thanks. I want to be banned? <laughs> no, not you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, we got a oh, Trump, uh, Trump Pence 2020. All right. Here we go. All right. Chris. The other day I was talking to a Trump supporter, uh, an anti-vaxxer too. Um, and we sat out, she brought her kids out because I have a lot of libertarian friends actually. I'm, I'm friends with the state chair for the Libertarian Party of Washington State. And we have great conversations because when, when you don't receive corporate money, you can actually have a good faith discussion of what's best for the country. And that's, that's what, you know, with, with President Trump or with any Republican, if you take corporate money, I can't trust a word you say. And that goes for Democrats, too. It goes for any party. In fact, I endorsed a libertarian candidate out here in Washington because his Democrat opponent takes corporate money and he doesn't. And that's where we can have a discussion. That's where this country can move forward. So, you know, uh, if that Chris person wants to ask any questions, they're welcome to, but that's my starting point is disagree with me all day, but know that these are my sincerely held beliefs. And I, I you know, they do come from me. They're not coming from the DNC. They're not coming from corporate donors. Absolutely. Yeah, he's, he's, he's hurling insults, so. He said oh, no from there, so I'm not really sure what that means, but you know, <laughs> these these damn hippies and their patchouli, or I'm not sure what the hell he's talking about. But <laughs> deodorant is overrated. Get me on the record saying that. We can make a poster. Deodorant is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my mother-in-law says. She's like, you know, I read these articles. I'm like, yeah, don't tell me that. I mean, thankfully, I can't tell, but um, <laughs> I digress. Um, so as, uh, as far as other parts of the Green New Deal, what else do you find important as far as 
um, let's say in Washington, even in your district, what environmentally do you think you need to focus on first? Our water and air is being poisoned. We have a Native American reservation out here with incredibly high cancer rates. And that's what that's where I want to get people is I'm, I'm done talking about climate change. What I'm talking about is, is I'm not done talking about it. It's there. But pollution, because these rural communities and there's a difference between farming communities and rural communities. Rural communities take up much more space than than the actual farming population, especially with factory farms. But you want clean air and water. If you're a hunter, if you're a fisher, if you just love the beauty around you, as so many rural communities do, you want clean air and water. And I almost feel like we're hurt by bringing it to climate change because then you can get into the weeds on science and everybody has a YouTube video or a study that they can pull from. But we should all agree that we want clean air and water, that we don't want our, you know, that I, I have friends who um, on the campaign that they, they were in, uh, oh gosh, they were somewhere in Southeast Asia and they were in a small village and the water supply was being poisoned by just some pesticide that was leaking in there. And then they went back to California and their town was warning people not to drink the water because that same substance was leaking into the water in California. That's where we're at. Yeah. Wow. That is incredible. Yeah. You bring up a really good point. If there's some way we can kind of change the narrative and talk about how we need to work on things that are already happening and then make it sustainable by continuing the Green New Deal. That's actually a really good idea. I've never heard anyone um, bring that up. Um, what um, what else is going on as far as how many candidates are you running against? Is it just you and the Republican incumbent? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we need uh, money because right now it's just me versus the Republican incumbent. She's homophobic. My LGBTQ heart really wants to crush her on that, but there's a lot of good reasons. Trust me me and this district's weak she thinks it's a walk she thinks it's easy it's not it's soft we can take it we've got to knock on every door now here's the thing since i'm not accepting corporate donations i support progressive policies there there's no obvious front runner our district doesn't have i promise i'm out there i'm looking there's no like obviously we're going to send this person to run no and so we just need to hit some fundraising targets this dish or that sorry this quarter and the, we will get the establishment and the progressives on our team. And all of 2019, we get both sides just ready to take this district and replace a Trump Republican with a working progressive. Uh, and there's a chance though, that if we don't, if we don't get to where we need to be um, to kind of gain that establishment respect without sacrificing our morals and values, that corporate interests could just hop in. I'm just, a, I'm an activist, uh, I'm a nobody. You know, I, I helped organize the climate strike out here and we got about a thousand people and me and Jay Inslee were the only two politicians who spoke because he's the governor and I show up to the meetings <laughs> with the Sunrise Movement. Um, but there's a chance that corporate interests could swoop in, grab a nobody and just start throwing money at them, even if they know that it'll tank both our chances um, because they'd rather a corporate Republican than a working class progressive who, who you know, serves the needs of the people. So when um, when is the final day to enter your race? March. March. Back oh. date because I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's in March to get on the ballot. I mean, technically, you could be a write-in. Uh, we do open primaries, by the way, out here. Um, so I'm not yeah. going head-to-head -head with any Democrat. Um, it, we could end up with two Republicans in the general, two Democrats. It's, it's completely open. Um, but like I said, we're gaining the steam and the supports there and the people, people want to support the truth. The truth can win in 2020 because that's what people want. And the, the democratic leadership here, I don't know if it's other places, cause this is what I know is Eastern Washington, but the democratic leadership up here, there's no sense that they should mentor people or guide them. And the Republicans they're it's like, we're the rugged individualists and they're the communal people because the Republican party in this district is training people. They're moving them around. They're like, we, 
think you got potential. Let's stick you over here. And then eventually when this person's ready to retire, we'll move you there. And we're just, I say we, cause that's my party is they're just like, what rich person is going to show up? I mean, our, our candidate in 2018, they can't, they they can't even guess why she lost. They're like, Oh, she raised so much money and she lost. It must be unwinnable. No, she was elitist. She, she was overheard saying, if I lose, I'm going to sell a few of my houses. She wasn't approachable. She, you know, there's just so many anecdotes about, you know, public, public speaking engagements and private fundraisers. She didn't, get out with the activist community. She didn't engage with people in that way. Just because you have money to throw at college students or people of color doesn't mean you're going to get their vote. You got to go out and earn it. Absolutely. Rant over. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. Um, Christy, um, he is in Washington State District 5. Andy, I'm trying to concentrate. <laughs> Andy said, did you did you know that MAGA hats were first invented to hide lobotomy scars? I can't. I can't, Andy. <laughs> this is this is he's my sanity. Um, <laughs> um so as far as prescription drugs, do you guys have a big opioid problem there? Not as much as other parts of the country. Um, so I'm actually originally from New York and New Jersey. I've lived here for about 10 years. This was my, my first duty station was in our district. So I know the Rust Belt pretty well from my upbringing. Much more out there. In our district, the opiate epidemic just hasn't hit in the same way. Um, I mean, our median income is not where it needs to be. The cost of housing is skyrocketing out here. And wouldn't you know it, most of uh, most of the elected officials own property. So they have a financial incentive for the property to continue to go up in price. You know, um, our half of our, our city council race here in Spokane, they raise, they're going to raise about a million dollars total. Half of it's coming from the Realtors Association. So that's, that's probably the biggest thing on a lot of people's minds in this district, more so than um, the opiate epidemic. So do you support a cap on rent, rent control? Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually working on a piece of uh, legislation I'd like to propose. Uh, I'm working on four right now. I released my first one, the Income Justice Act, but I'm working on one. Uh, it's called the MAGA Act, which stands for Managing Affordable Housing Act. And it, uh, it completely removes money for subsidized housing and moves that into public housing with the goal of having as much public housing as we need for everyone to be able to have housing. Uh, and that ties in with my living wage policy. I mean, I do support Fight for 15, but what I would rather see is for us to calculate the wage in any given area based on the, uh, the, the median rent for you say you know, it's a single person for a single person one bedroom apartment multiply that by um by three and then divide it by 40 hours a week for a 16 160 hours a week and then that's the hourly wage so in our in spokane proper that would be about 17 dollars and 20 cents ish an hour and <clears throat> but um yeah rent control public housing the subsidized housing out here. It's just so obvious they're trying to make money. That's their job. And how's that going to be more efficient than just doing it? Absolutely. Um, okay. So, and then I wanted to talk to you about, um, you created legislation, the Income Justice Act. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, I'll start with the Income Justice Act then and because it rolls in with housing. Uh, well, okay, the housing one is actually the MAGA Act, Managing Affordable Housing Act, or uh, wait, there's a G in there. I'm still working on it. I want to give it a fun acronym, steal it from the right, you know, but uh, that one's all about uh, rent control, public housing, and ending subsidized housing and replacing it with as much uh, public housing as we need, <clears throat> rolling that in with living wage, where you, with the rent control, you're looking at three times the uh, median rent in an area and then just uh, multiplying that by three and dividing it by 160 work hours. And that's your minimum wage here in Spokane. That's about 1720. Uh, and actually that reminds me of a really fun quote because I'm totally on board for fight for 15, but uh, the first victim of authoritarianism is nuance. 
And that's what's been lost in so much of our political discourse. <clears throat> you know, suddenly it's, are you for or against the Second Amendment? Are you for or against abortion? Every issue is just topped into this for or against category. And that's not really how things work at all. And I think that's why I'm able to get the support I am uh, across the political spectrum is because without sacrificing any ounce of my morals and values or policy specifics. Now, the Income Justice Act puts, uh, it requires 51% non-executive employee ownership of all publicly traded companies, because what better tool can you give the unions than the ability to fi fire the CEO with a vote? Uh, it also uh, institutes the baby bond, which uh, under my bill would be $1,000 worth of US Treasury bonds given to every child born in the United States, accessible only to them when they turn 18. Those are Brewing interest over time. It also has a cap on executive pay. Now, this is where me and Senator Sanders disagree. His executive pay cap is 50 times the median employee's wage. Mine is 100 times the lowest paid employee's wage. But ran the numbers compared to, say, the uh, CEO of McDonald's, and they would make slightly more under my plan. I think they'd make about about 12 million on Senator Sanders' median plan and my about 18 million on my plan. But either way, you know, I like pulling from the people who are paid the least. He's going for medium, median, either way, it's cool. So that's the rundown on the Income Justice Act. I do, I do definitely like the idea of the lowest paid. I, I definitely like that because well, you know, I'm in Pennsylvania. The minimum wage is still seven twenty five. That's insane. That is absolutely insane. I I can never live on that, especially if I had kids. That's crazy. Now in Washington, I know Seattle, but in the whole state of Washington, is it fifteen minimum? No. Here on the on the um, east side of the state. Uh, it is right now 1250 um, or sorry, 1150, 1150. Uh, they're working on bringing it up. And, our, you know, Washington State's one of the most fiscally responsible progressive states in the entire country. It's so impressive. Yeah, we're not at 15 here yet. We're at 1150. And like I said, I do like the idea more than just a blanket 15, which I would vote for, is actually looking at at the cost of living in an area and adjusting based on that. Although ideally tying executive pay to and compens total compensation to your lowest paid employee, I think could be a, something that could get us out of even needing a minimum wage, especially with employee ownership in companies. It's just a whole new way to approach it. That's a, yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when it comes down to it, they might, forego their, I need $20 million a year when they realize they're going to have to pay their employees more. They might just be like, you know what, I'll take a pay cut. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, speaking to people um, in business, they want executive pay caps. They do. There is an arms race among companies to pay their executives more and more. And the only ones who benefit are the executives. But plenty of people who run these companies and own publicly traded companies do not want to be paying $100 million a year for, for their CEO, you know. Absolutely. Um, let me see. What else do I have on my list? Um, do you guys have for-profit prisons? Uh, no, not in Washington State. That's no. good. Um, yeah, Jay Inslee is not perfect, but uh, he's made some really good policy proposals here in this state. And I'm really proud of Washington, honestly. Now, what would you like to change as far as criminal justice reform? Well, number one is end the war on drugs and legalize sex work. The war on drugs essentially turns police into an occupying military force. Uh, <clears throat> it was the same training we received because I did law enforcement stateside in the military <coughs> and security overseas. And so what it all came down to was you're looking at every single person you meet as someone who could potentially be dangerous or a criminal or someone you have to worry about. 
So, you know, they, they would show us video and videos and training, whether it was deployed doing security or law enforcement stateside of police and military people getting shot by innocuous looking folks. So they're training you to be scared of everybody. And they would even say, you want to go home tonight? You better be prepared to pull your gun. And that's what I believe, you know, the war on drugs has, and, and legal or criminalized sex work has really done in this country is turn the police into, you know, an occupying force that sees us as the enemy. And the fact is, if you get pulled over and it, it's very elitist and uh, racially oppressive because you can, having done law enforcement, they, we should run the numbers and, and do some research because I guarantee you, the chances of your vehicle getting searched if it's in bad shape or if you're a person of color are far higher than if you're driving a Tesla. If you're driving a Tesla, you stick as much cocaine as you want in the trunk of that thing. The police aren't going to search it, you know? So it really gets to the heart of so many downstream issues in our country, like institutional racism. And again, it's a money pit. Heroin has gotten cheaper in the last 30 years. What else has gotten cheaper? We continue to dump billions of dollars into the war on drugs. Maybe we should dump billions of dollars into a war on pharmaceutical drugs and they'll get cheaper too, huh? Yeah, <laughs> war on uh, the minimum wage. Oops, it just went up. <laughs> Yeah, you know what's interesting, and this is kind of, I don't know, I just, it's funny, you and Laura Ashcraft are the only two people who have brought up legalizing sex work, and or decrim sex work, and you're both- Legalize on my Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know if you did. Oh, I'm for not just decriminalizing sex work, legalizing, regulating, approving. I don't know where she is on that, but yeah, she's also a comic, so that's, that's funny. Yeah. Well, it's so important. And, you know, um, not enough, um, I was going to say comedians, but not, not enough um, candidates talk about that. But it's so important. And I got to say, you know, I read Bernie Sanders, um, his uh, uh, criminal justice reform bill, and it is phenomenal. It is so amazing. But sex work is not in there. It needs to be in there um, because, yeah, I mean, it would change a lot of lives if if we, you know, decriminalized it. That's for sure. Um, let me see. Um, what's that? Oh, we should, and I'll make sure that uh, the sex workers are able to unionize too. Oh yeah, that'd be awesome. Just going one level further. That'd be awesome. Um, I'm gonna take your. I'm against civil asset forfeiture. It's just government stealing, and that's another one. I get to see we got to build these variants. Hate civil asset forfeiture, so I just get to come up to them and say, "Hey, guess what? We disagree with that too. We're not on board for that as well." Uh, you know, they find a bunch of money in your car and they just decide to take it and you never get it back because it's suspicious you have a bunch of cash. That's, I'm pro freedom, but I just believe you need to have health care to be able to pursue life, liberty and happiness. You know, like the, the legal structure, when I'm framing this to concede and libertarians especially, is I, this, this is the order that these matter. Life is more important than anyone's liberties and liberties are more important than anyone's happiness. And that's been for the entire history of the United States that each one is more important than the subsequent one. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of, let me see, Texas working in medium security. Um, not entirely sure what you mean, um, but you know, we've, we've all been seeing the news now, yesterday and today, um, in Texas with, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name without looking at it, Botham, um, mm -hmm. with the gentleman who testified has now been murdered. Um, my feeling is, I don't know how much you, you know about it, but my feeling is that an independent investigation needs to happen because there's definitely a lot of racism in that 
um, with cops, period. <laughs> I don't know if you've had a yeah. chance to dig into that case, but I think that's what um, this gentleman's referring to. Yeah. Yeah, institutional racism, that's what I think it's important to bring the conversation away from who is racist to what is right, you know, what creates racism? What are systems that, you know, because we understand, like if you grow up in a certain environment, you're far more likely to end up with drug addiction issues. Well, the same goes, I saw it when I was in the military where, you know, doing law enforcement, where the system creates patterns and pathways where it's just, that's the natural way for you to go. So as far as the, the witness who was killed, of course, we need <clears throat> sources outside of the police department to look at it. And, you know, the expression, one bad apple spoils the bunch. I don't think people do enough digging on that. And it's really relevant to law enforcement in particular, because if you leave one bad apple, then it will spoil any subsequent, any apples you put in after that. You have to get rid of all of the apples and put new apples in. And we experienced that uh, in the 70s, especially when a, when a lot of criminal activity and corruption was going on in many police departments, where eventually they realized you just have to fire every single person in that department and hire all new people or else the corruption and racism will just continue. But so much of this is downstream, in my view, from the war on drugs and criminalized sex work, because those are war. It's a war on poverty. It's a war on the people because rich people don't use less drugs than poor people. That's just a fact. Intergenerational wealth is one of the greatest causes or one of the greatest has one of the highest levels of association with criminal behavior, but they're above the law because in the United States, you get as much justice as you can afford. And most people can't afford justice. And so, <clears throat> you know, I think so much of it's going to come from demilitarizing the police, which ties back with that. Uh, we, I mean, I would, I'd volunteer today to go, you know, get rid of the gun. You know, one of the big things they like to push, we have this con a conservative and a, a corporate candidate in a town out here who are running for mayor. And they're both pushing um, uh, like sensitivity training for cops and community programs where cops go out in the community. They don't work. They don't, that's just a fact. People like it. it sounds nice. It sounds so good. It's like being tough on crime. Like we want more community policing. The police don't give a damn about your sensitivity training or your community policing. You know why? Because when you send those cops out into those communities, people are scared of them. It's like a show of force. You're walking around with these guns and all this, all this body armor and they're supposed to be happy to see you. No, they're scared because you're the one putting people in cages for things that aren't immoral. A hundred years ago, Barnum and Bailey learned when you put an animal in a cage with the cement floors and the metal bars and it's by itself, it hurts its brain. It makes them more violent and more dangerous. And we do that to humans today. Why would I want to, to interact with the cops that come into my neighborhood? Rant done. That's true. Why don't um, Allison, a teammate, she, she brings up my next question. Um, do you support ending cash bail? Yeah, I really like in New Jersey, the system that they've implemented with having an algorithm that, uh, sorts out people's likelihood of, of future, um, recidivism. And that seems to work pretty well. Cash bail is just another, you know, classist elitist tool, not on board for it. We know that you can just put together a formula and guess how likely someone is to run away or stay there. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, is there anything else you would like to add um, that we haven't discussed? Hmm, let's see. Don't give me that Any smile. Well, you know you can get it. See, that's <laughs> what's going to let you win right there. Did you guys see that? That's what's going to get him to win. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, I guess I'll close just by telling the story of, um, you know, what really brought me into politics. So my mother has lupus. And so, you know, she has a lot of health issues. And I remember being deployed to the Middle East and, you know, on my first deployment and seeing how 
medical bills were popping up and she was getting all these co-pays and all the stress it put on her and my, and a lot of people in our parents' generation, or my, my parents' generation, I'm 27, by the way, uh, you know, they, they feel like a failure if they can't give absolutely everything needed to the people they love. And so I, I can only, you know, I, I, I feel it even talking about it, how much that, that probably hurt my dad and, and still hurts him to this day, um, you know, that every bill can't be covered medically. And, you know, that doesn't make anyone a failure. That doesn't make them uh, less worthy or less good. My parents are hardworking, smart people. And the people in my community are. I mean, every day on Facebook, I see people who are suicidal because they can't afford to get treatment that they need. I, I met with somebody who was a drama teacher for 40 years and he told me about how a student hurt their and the mother, he knew the mother was going to have to choose. Are we going to get an x-ray because x-rays are expensive or are we going to buy food for the next week because that's what co-pays do to people. And so I'm, I'm here, I'm doing this because um, when you have someone who's who's wealthy and entrenched in the system and in it for themselves, regardless of what letters next to their name, they're not going to fight with all of their heart to make these changes. They're just not. We need someone who knows the pain. And, you know, my opponent's community is wealthy people who are just detached from what all of us are going through. I know what it's like to make minimum wage with a master's degree. And so many other things and to see the pain in my community that's caused by their decisions. And so she goes to her community and she looks them in the eyes and they're like, yeah, you made us all richer. And I, when I'm in Congress, I can come back and I can look my friends in the eyes and I can say, these are the laws I co-authored for you guys. Then for my family and for everybody. And so that's, that's why I'm here. And I hope, um, you know, if this is something you believe in, even if you're not in my district, it's still one vote in the house that believes in these things. So consider, uh, you know, you can go to armitageforcongress.com or you can go to act blue and search Armitage for Congress, A R M I T A G E, because we, after 2020, we can't have corporate Democrats running the show. We need every progressive body we can get in Congress. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, most of us are, are Bernie supporters, but we all know he can't do it alone. He, we need people like Chris to be in there to actually help him pass things that are progressive. Um, so, yeah, definitely follow him on Twitter, Real ARMI. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Real Army is on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Army is like my nickname. My friends call me Army. Uh, so real A R M I on Twitter, totally. Okay, sweet. So you guys follow him there. Um, go on his website. Also, you guys know the drill. Send this to anyone you know in Washington, um, or share it and tag them. Um, because this is the point of independent media. We have to get. Um, these people's names out and um, make sure that people know what they're about. Um, thank you guys so much for watching as usual. Um, Thursday, I have um, a woman named Taylor Hudak. Um, she is one of the organizers for the vigil for Julian Assange. Um, she's going to be here. We're going to be discussing what's going on currently with him. Um, if she works with Julianne's mom. Um, so we'll be talking about that next Tuesday. I have um, Jason call. He's a, a Bernie crat. Um, so he'll be joining me then as well. And I have some two, two people who I'm just like literally fangirling over, but I'm not going to mention them yet because yeah, I'm going to be like that. I'm too nervous that it won't happen, <laughs> but I was fangirling. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but thank you guys again for watching. Um, I'll probably do weekend review tomorrow night as well. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate it. You're amazing. And we wish you best of luck with everything. Thank you. Look forward to talking again. Appreciate you having me. All right. Take care.